so good Wednesday morning. It is a beautiful morning here in Maryland. It's uh, cool. It's in the 60s. Uh, it's sunny. I'm sitting here once again on my back porch. Thank you, Gloria, for my um, wonderful uh, little stand holder. Stand holder. My little uh, holder thing for my for my phone and as you can see me uh, behind me my sunflower continues to look beautiful and wonderful and my other plants that were in such bad shape they are now very very happy over there they're in the sun and uh, they got some rain yesterday plus I've been watering them and uh, they look great they're so much happier now which proves that everything flourishes, you know, if it's taken care of well. And so today we're going to continue in Proverbs 22. We're going to continue in Proverbs 22. So jump there in your Bible. And yesterday we ended with five, Proverbs 22 and five. And today is a scripture that everybody wants to quote and uh, sometimes you feel like, oh, as a parent, maybe I didn't do enough of this. But it says in Proverbs 22 and 6, train a child. Train a child. Or start a child. Or train up means to dedicate, to consecrate, to nurse, to teach, to discipline. Uh, last night, Steve and I watched a video on uh, from the dog whisperer, Cesar, uh, Cesar, I don't know his last name, and uh, he was talking about, and uh, even as we speak, my dog is pulling the stuffing out of a pillow. Max, my dog is pulling the stuffing out of a pillow over there. He's not behind me, so you can't see him today, but... Uh, we very much needed to watch uh, a couple of those videos. And here's what happened. It says that when you start them off, when you start a child, not a dog, but when you start a child off, that you're supposed to start them off right. You're supposed to begin their lives. That's why we dedicate babies at the church. That's why we make sure that, Steve and I made sure that our own children were dedicated, were consecrated, were allowed to know every day of their life, you belong to the Lord, you are a child of God. That's why it's so important that from the very, very, very beginning, children know that they are a child of God that they are supposed to be going in the way they're supposed to be going. Because the second part of this, it says, in the way he should go. In the way he should go. Now, in the Hebrew, this is a child's individual and inclination way of in the way they should go. I was thinking about that this morning. I was thinking about that this morning. So, when I was little, um, it became obvious, I think, as soon as Sally was born, that I wanted to be a teacher. I really wanted to be a teacher. I mean, as soon as Sally was born, you know, she was she was my classroom. It was wonderful. Uh, I, I got pamphlets from everywhere we went and taught her out of those. I taught her out of my little books. Uh, I just loved it, I loved it. Then when Sherry came along, I was nine years old when Sherry was born. Well, then I allowed her to come into our school also, but also I kind of was like, uh, I took care of her. She was like my baby. It's like mom and dad made this little baby and kind of let me just have it. She slept in the bed with me from the time she was little. I crawled up into her bed. So it became obvious to my mother and my dad that there were two things 
that were very important to me, even as a child, that I wanted to be a teacher and that I liked being a mother. And so mom and dad instilled that in me and allowed me and encouraged me to go that way, even though, even though it was kind of a sign of, do teachers make any money? Now, my dad was an accountant. <clears throat> my mother was a beautician who became an artist. So I had this really, yeah, we're in Proverbs, Proverbs 22. So I had this really great background of somebody who was very uh, uh, educated and intelligent minded, my daddy. And then my mother, who was this very creative person, very creative person. And so they really wanted that instilled in me, but they could tell I was kind of going towards being a teacher. And so they encouraged that in me. Steve's parents saw that he was going to be musically inclined. And so they'd encourage that in him. They bought him instruments and they allowed him to take lessons and they encouraged him. <clears throat> when we look at our lives and in the inclinations that God has for us, now, I'm not talking about gender right now. I'm talking about natural talents, natural skills, natural abilities, or maybe something that is a dream that maybe we don't even have the inclination for. But we want to. We want to. I am not musically inclined. I love music. I enjoy music. I took piano, terrible, terrible situation with the piano. I cannot play the piano. I, I, know the, I know the notes, but I cannot play the piano. Steve can sit down and just play the piano. Our son, Mike, just sat down, taught himself how to play the piano. He never took piano lessons. He did take trombone lessons while he was in high school. Michael, it became obvious, wanted to be an artist and could be an artist and is an artist. So we made every encouraging thing we could for him to be an artist. On the other hand, we also made sure to instill in all four of our children Airplane going over. Airplane going over. Somebody get ready to have a good vacation. We also made sure in all four of our children <clears throat> that they knew the Word of God and the love of God. Now, we didn't, we didn't torture them with that. We didn't turn them against the Lord by being so over the top that they didn't have a chance to come to know that Jesus is our loving Savior. We just lived our life with the kids. Yeah, they had to go to church, but they didn't have to go to church every time the doors were open. Steve did when he was a little boy. I did not. I went on Sunday morning and I went on Sunday night. And then when I was old enough, I chose to go on Wednesday night. I loved church. I have a great nephew who loves church. I love the feeling of it. And so God has allowed me to just move into that, to just have that as my life. This says, train up a child in the way they should go. Then when they're old, they will not depart from it. Now, I've read in several places that this is not a promise, but it is a principle. It is a principle. So, let me just mention this. When our little grandson, Oscar, was born, his daddy speaks English and his mother speaks German. So, they speak English in that home. But Katrin speaks German 
not completely, but she does, from the very first to Oscar. As she would sit and rock him and nurse him and love on him, she sang to him and she spoke to him in German. Now, Oscar doesn't speak German all the time. He speaks English. But as he gets older, more and more, he's speaking German. He can say things to me in German and he, he explains things to me. He explains things to me, he says, oh, that's English, Nanny, but now I'm gonna say it in German. You see, Cotron has trained him as a child and when he is old, that's gonna be in him. What if he decided when he was a teenager, I don't wanna speak German anymore, okay. That's your choice, but it's in there. It's in there, and you're fluent. You see, as our children get older, they have free will. They have free will. So maybe they will leave for a time, a season. Maybe it'll be for a couple of seasons, but it's in there. It's in there, and they know it. They know how to quote scripture. They know how to sing those songs. It's in there. They know how to respect the house of God. They know how to respect those who have God as their life. Then, as they get older, that's in there. And it comes back to them. It comes back to them. One time, Steve and I and our children, when they were teenagers, we were in a van. It was, so it was uh, me and Steve and a bunch of long-legged uh, teenagers. And they said, uh, they started singing ads, ad jingles. And I said to them, I mean, this has been going on for quite some time. It was a long trip. And... I said, I wish you guys knew as many scriptures as you do ad jingles. And they immediately started quoting scripture. One after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. One on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. You see, it was in there. It was in there. They know it. Now, John is a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and so is Amy. And so, of course, they know a lot of scripture. It's their job. But it's in there. It's in there. The other two work out. Uh, they don't ha they're not ministers, but it's in there. That gave me great hope during certain times of my life and the lives of my children to know that it's not a promise, but it's a principle. It's a principle that we can lean on, that we can depend on, that we can have faith in, that we can thank God for every day. That's why those of you who don't know I live in Fort Washington, Maryland. So that means that every plane that comes into National Airport flies right over my house and it's starting to land. That's what's going on out there. You see, we have that principle, that promise that we can lean on, that we can depend on. Train them up in the way they should go. And when they're old, it really should say they can't depart from it. As much as Oscar cannot unlearn German, when his grandmother, when his Oma came, comes over and it's just her and Katrin and Oscar there in the ha house, they just speak German all the time. And I don't, I don't have a clue what they're saying. Now, when they're in front of us, they're very polite and they speak English. 
But when it's just the three of them, I mean, it must be heaven for them. They're just speaking German. So that's in him. When we are speaking Christian, and I'm not talking just talking the talk and not walking the walk, but when the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart are obvious when our children are little, well, it's, they're going to grow up with that in them. When he is old, he will not depart from it. I sent that scripture to Maya today, and I said, it's awesome scripture. You should read it. Because I love it. I sent her another one that we'll get to in just a minute. Then it says, uh, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. The rich rule over the poor because they have a more authority and they have a bigger voice. We can say all we want to, but the truth is, the rich, they have a big voice. They have authority. They're able to let their voice be known. And the debt that some of us have been in, it's demoralizing and it's debilitating. Have you ever been in debt? You don't even have to raise your hand or, or do anything because I'm going to guess that we've all been in debt. We've all been in debt. And it is the most terrible, terrible feeling. Sunday, when I was taking the offering, I was talking about being in debt to a credit card company, and it just kept, um, it just kept growing and growing. No matter what I did, no matter how much I paid, it was growing, and it became debilitating to me. I hated the fifteenth or sixteenth of the month because I knew they were going to take this big chunk out of my paycheck. And here's the thing: paying the minimum amount. I was never going to get out of that. Never. And it didn't help that I hadn't put any more on it because every month the interest on it was staggering. I don't care what they say. Staggering. So I got some inheritance money and I paid that off. I paid that off. I took my credit card and I cut it up into tiny jibbies. A couple of months later, they sent me a letter saying I owed them 41 cents. I picked up the phone and I called them and I said, I know you did not just send me a bill for 41 cents. We'd love to have you back. You'll never have me back. I've been in that bondage. I will not go back. I'm not going back into that. It is debilitating. When you are a borrower, you are beneath those who have been loaning you money. And I'm going to tell you something. If you want to lose a friend, lend them some money. Here's what I do. If somebody wants to borrow some money from me, and I'm talking about a big amount. I'm not talking about $20, $50. I'm talking about if somebody says, comes to me and says, I need to borrow $1,000 from you. Well, here's what I say to myself. I'm actually going to give that to them. One of my grandchildren uh, needed to borrow some money from me. And she called me. Oh, I shouldn't have said she. She called me. And she explained why she needed it. And I said, okay, I'm going to give you part of that. And then you'll repay me the rest of it. And within a month or two, she had paid it off. You see, I could trust her. I didn't want that between us, though. What if she couldn't have... Well, I'm going to tell you, I would have immediately called her and said, I forgive you of that debt because I don't want that over her life. She's too young. All right. So then it says, uh, borrowers are in a lower place. And I want you to look at Exodus 21, 2 through 7. Look at Exodus 21, 2 through through seven. Exodus 21, 
two through seven. Listen to how they used to pay off debt. Exodus 21, two through seven. If you buy a Hebrew servant, so in other words, someone who is in debt, that's how they used to pay off their debt. They sold themselves to pay off their debt. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years. But in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. If he comes alone, he is to go free alone. But if he has a wife, when, she come, when he comes, she is to go with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master and only the man go free. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. If a man sells his daughter as a servant, she is not to go free as men servants do. Are you listening to this? Are you listening to how they would have to pay a debt then? How they would pay a debt then? How many of us have gone into debt... And made a deal with the devil. And made a deal with the devil. Borrowers are in the lower place. I don't ever want to be in the lower place again. I'm getting ready to say something that probably I had decided I was not going to reveal. But I have never lived in a house that we did not have to make a mortgage payment. We never have. Steve and I never have. I, I don't know about mom and dad, but I've never lived in a house that we didn't have to make a mortgage payment. Now, I own cars that are paid for. Uh, we have done that. We, we have paid off all of our cars, and we don't owe anything on any of our cars. The church gave us a car. Um, the Sequoia has been paid for for, uh, for a long time. <clears throat> a long time. It had a lot of mileage on it when we bought it, so a long time. My BMW's been paid off. I've got a 95 BMW. Oh, and our Sienna is paid off. We're paying a mortgage on this house. But our house in Tennessee is paid for. And I can't tell you what an awesome feeling that is. I mean, I'm telling you, it's an incredible feeling. Steve's parents paid so carefully that they paid that house off early so that if something were to happen to Brother Lowry, that Sister Lowry wouldn't have to make payments. He took care of that. It was her idea, but he took care of it. Then she died before him and they left the house to us, me and Steve. So I'm getting ready to live in a house that is paid for. I'm, I'm not bragging. I'm so thankful I can't stand it. I, I, I mean, I, I cannot tell you how thankful I am for that blessing in my life. Marion, it is mind, mind blowing. And I give, I give thanks to God, and I give thanks to Steve's mom and dad every time I walk in the door of that house. God gives us blessings. He wants us to be careful how we get into debt. I know we feel like we need that car, that we need that house. I know that. I've been that girl. I've been that girl. Steve and I were set, sitting at a red light the other day, and this uh, Jeep thing was across from us, and it was the most awesome color. And I said, 
to Steve, I kind of want that. I do. I kind of want that. And he said, really? And I said, yeah, I love it. What is that? And so we continued to look at it. And Steve said, do you want it bad enough to have debt? And I said, no. I have a very wise husband. Very wise husband. I'm the impulsive one. He's the very wise one. Look at the next scripture. Uh, Proverbs 22 and 7. The uh, No, we just did that one. He, 22 and 8, Proverbs 22 and 8. He who sows wickedness reaps trouble, and the rod of his fury will be destroyed. Now, we know what it means when it says, he who sows wickedness reaps trouble. I mean, the, sows, the seeds that you sow, that's what you reap. Uh, my sunflower, we planted, uh, or somebody planted uh, sunflower seeds, and it, it has grown into a sunflower. If you plant roses, you get roses. If you plant green beans, you get green beans. If you plant tomatoes, you have tomatoes for the rest of your life because they just keep going back into the ground and coming back up. You will have more tomatoes than Heinz Ketchup Company. You will. If you sow wickedness, that's what your life is going to have. That's... I just talked about my in-laws sowing into that home, and therefore, I reaped an inheritance. I, my husband and I, we reaped that inheritance. I, and I, I can't tell you how excited I am because they, they sowed good seeds. They sowed good seeds into Steve. We just talked about training up a child in the way they should go. If you sow good seeds into those children... Now, there might be some weeds and there might be some other stuff that tries to come in there and surround that. But I'm going to tell you something. If you sow good seeds into your children, into their lives, you're going to reap that. If you are cursing and smoking and drinking and showing a life of addiction, if you have no respect for the church, if you have no respect for uh, your pastor, you're going to reap that too. Then when they're old enough and they're throwing those things back in your face, well, you used to say the same thing when, you know, you used to smoke the same stuff, you used to wear the same kind of clothes, you used to date the same kind of men, you used to live the same kind of life. You're going to reap that too. You're going to reap that too. You're going to reap that too. That's why it's so important that what you sow is what you want to reap back. That what you sow into the lives of your family, you want that to come right back into your life. It's something that you want. But then the rod of his fury will be dis destroyed. I could not figure out what that meant. The rod of his fury will be destroyed. That means his weapon his weapon, God, <clears throat> is not going to allow the wicked to prosper. God is not going to allow the wicked to prosper. I'm going to say that again, and you say it too. God is not going to allow the wicked to prosper. He's going to destroy their weapon. Anger, fury vengeance, strife. That's their weapons. That's their weapons. I mean, look down, look down at 10. Drive out the mocker and out goes strife. Quarrels and insults are ended. How many of you know somebody who just wants to bring anger and fury and quarrels, mockers? That's what a, a, someone who uh, your oppression of others will end. Thank you, Sally. It will end, and you will know it's got to end. If you're bringing all of that, if you're allowing all of that into your life, my mother used to say, do not allow confusion in the lives of your children, or they will grow up, and they themselves will be confused. 
mom was so worried about that. My mother's and daddy's life was, you get up at a certain time, you get the kids up, you go downstairs, you have coffee, uh, cream only, have coffee with cream, toast, and uh, dad drives the kids to school, mom stays home, does the house. I had a very, very, very traditional family. Very. At five o'clock, Daddy walked in the door, and we sat down, and we ate dinner. Very traditional. We did awesome things. We took great vacations, but that was not the lifestyle that I followed once I got married. Steve and I, sometimes up until late, late at night, Sometimes we ate dinner late. If we went to a different church, maybe we were out late. We always had our kids with us, but we did all kinds of different things. Sometimes our life took us, um, well, we traveled overseas, and my mother would say, I hope your children do not live in too much confusion. Drive out the mocker. Get that stuff out of your life that confusion out of your life. Now, my life was not confusion, and my children grew up to have the same lifestyle Steve and I do. They all have wacky schedules, and they have their children with them all the time, and they're wonderful, wonderful, um, sane adults. I don't think they've had to have too much therapy because of, of their mother and their daddy, but maybe they have. I don't, I don't know. But I made sure that the things that were in their life were not sinful people, were not angry people, that they were peaceful people. I planted those seeds in the lives of my family. Let me tell you one last thing about driving out confusion and driving out uh, all kinds of stuff. When you yourself, when your heart is at peace, It doesn't matter what's going on around you if those are good things going on around you. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Last week, uh, Monday, I think, of last week is when I moved, when uh, they moved our furniture there into our house in Cleveland. And there was a lot going on. A lot going on. Sherry was there and she, uh, she fed us. Uh, every couple of hours, she came out with something new for us to eat. We had fruit, we had sandwiches, we had juice, we had chips, we had breakfast biscuits. Uh, so Sherry had that going on. Sally was the director and the designer of where everything was going to go. Amy also was in there um, helping us move things around, and we were trying to decide what should go where, and I had it planned out in my mind, and then when I got there, my so a lot of my furniture was a lot bigger than I thought it was, and uh, so we were deciding this has to go, this has to stay, and uh, my brother-in-law was there, Aaron was there, um, you know, taking care of things and working hard, Maya and Justin were there, and uh, so it was a lot going on, a lot going on. A lot going on. And then at one point, Sally and Sherry and I went into my living room that now had furniture in it, uh, my family room. And I laid down on the couch, and they laid down in two recliners, and uh, Sally rigged up this place to have a nap. And even though there was all kinds of stuff going on, I was at such peace that I laid down... I could halfway listen because Amy was still talking about her dad's office. She didn't like the way we had it set up, so she's in there working. And Maya came over and threw a blanket over me and kissed me on the head. And I took a good nap. When you get rid of mockers, when you get rid of people who just want to come in and fuss and fight, when you are at such peace, then stuff can be going on around you. 
But man, you can lay down and sleep in peace. Hear that bird singing? Peace, peace, wonderful peace. Guys, we've got to get rid of the strife in our life. We've got to get rid of the people who only want to cause confusion. We, we've got to make sure that what we're doing is the Lord's will in our life. And then we sit and we enjoy the peace that passes all understanding. Parents, it's our job. Even now, my kids are in their 40s. Even now, I try to make sure that mockers, that people who bring strife cannot be a part of the lives of my children. Maybe you're thinking they're grown. They're my children. That one scene, I cannot think of the movie, but where the young man is standing in his father's face and he says, I'm not a child. And the father says to him, you're my child. I think that's what our father says to us, I'm a child. I'm a child of God. And he's going to remove the mockers. He's going to drive out the wicked. Because the wicked, their fury, their weapons will be destroyed. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the peace. I thank you for the peace. I thank you, Lord, that you surround us and that you cover us. And that the wicked will not prevail in my life or the lives of my family members. That my children will listen to that inner self that, that was put deep inside them when they were little. And that they will strive to be men and women of God. And that they will sow that same seed into their children. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. God bless you. National Church of God people and those of you who love National Church of God, Steve and I are getting ready to go into a very important meeting that could mean a real blessing into our church. A real blessing into our church. So at 1130... I want you to be praying with us that God will move in a miraculous way and National Church of God will receive that blessing. God bless you. I love you. You know I love you. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.